O Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to know the peace of God, the grace of God, the certainty of God's love that gave you the forgiveness of sins by the cross of Jesus Christ. It gave you the certainty of eternal life by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want you to know the certainty that you can stand before God in that day when he says, come home, and you can stand there absolutely without any fear. And I want you to know the power of the resurrection. I'm going to use a rather silly illustration, but it's okay because I'm an old man. We're living in a time of financial difficulty with the war in the Ukraine and changing economy, difficulty in getting things transported. Personally, when I hear about financial problems, I, I don't worry. I just look at the Ukraine and I see those beautiful people and all their courage and I see all the things that they are doing. I see people coming and helping. I don't worry about it very much. But let's just suppose that you've got a lot of debt, uncontrolled credit card debt. Got to pay the rent. You got to pay the mortgage. You're going downhill fast into debt. You're spending more than what you're earning. And someone comes along and hands you a million dollars. Says, here, it's yours. No attached. What are you going to do with it? And if you tell me that you're going to run to the bank and deposit it for one-tenth of one percent interest, or you're going to take some of it and you're going to invest it under guidance. If you tell me that, you're going to set it away until the day that you need it, then you've got worse dementia than I do. No, what you're going to do is you're going to pay off your debt. And then you're going to take a course from Ramsey and how to avoid credit card debt. And then you're going to deposit wisely and invest so that when you need it, it's there. Now, let's take the financial and put it into the spiritual. God has given you the forgiveness of sins. God has given you the victory over death. And God has given you the power of the resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's given you the power of the Holy Spirit. What are you doing with it? Are you using it? Or are you waiting to use it when you, you really need it? I'm a Lutheran. And I'm very thankful to be a Lutheran. My mom was a Southern Baptist. My dad was an agnostic. We went to school in Mount Calvary Lutheran School in Denver because they wanted a good education for her boys. My mom took confirmation, became a member of the Lutheran Church. My dad continued to be a skeptic and an agnostic. But he did permit my mother to be confirmed, and he allowed me to be baptized. Little did he know that God was using him. But I find difficulty with the Lutheran Church, and it's only its name. When people hear that I'm a pastor, they ask me, 
what kind of pastor are you? And if I say Lutheran, I get the weirdest responses. Some people think that I'm a follower of a political activist who was involved in the civil rights marches in the 60s, which I was. And some people think I worship the devil because they hear the word Luther, they confuse it with Lucifer, which according to Isaiah 14:12, is the official name of Satan. So I've decided this, when people say to me, what kind of a pastor are you? I'm going to say, I'm a Philippian. And they're going to look at me and ask a natural question. What do you Philippians believe? Now notice the smile on my face. It goes along with that beautiful gotcha when you have been able to manipulate people to ask the question for which you want to give the answer. So let me tell you about the Philippians. My reference point is Acts chapter 16. I'm not going to read it to you. I'm going to summarize it. We're told that Paul and Silas, Timothy and Luke were looking for a new field of mission and everywhere they wanted to go, the Lord's Spirit shut them down. Blocks the way. Well, finally, Paul had a dream. And in that dream, he saw a man from Macedonia. And the man from Macedonia said, come over and help us. So Paul concluded that's where he was supposed to go. The Lord said, finally, you got the message. They went to Macedonia. They got to Philippi. They proclaimed the gospel there. There was a woman by the name of Lydia, a businesswoman, seller of purple. She became converted. She was baptized, and she received the spiritual gift of hospitality. She invited the disciples in to use her home as their base. Well, one day they were out walking, looking for a place to minister, and there was this girl who came behind them, just plaguing them. She was possessed by a spirit. And she told the truth. She said, these men are servants of the Most High God and, and worshipers of Jesus Christ. But she said it in such a way that it was offensive. And finally, Paul got tired of it. And he cast out the demon by the power of Christ. And that woman was relaxed and sweet and peaceful and you would have thought that people would come along and be joyful that she was no longer possessed? No. -uh. They arrested Paul and Silas because this girl also had the ability to foretell fortunes, and now that she didn't have the spirit, she lost the ability. Her owners lost their income. So they came up to Paul and Silas, and arrested them for disturbing the peace. Now, I don't know why they didn't arrest Luke and Timothy. In my worst moments, I think that maybe officials came and said, who caused this ruckus? And, 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 and Luke and Timothy said, these guys, I don't know if that's true or not. I hope not. But they arrested them. They beat them. They put them into prison. They locked them in stocks in pain. Now listen to what Luke tells us in Acts 16. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. What? kind of a man, demented idiot, is arrested unjustly, beaten unjustly, imprisoned unjustly, 
sits in stocks and he's in pain and he sings prayer. One who has the power of the resurrection. One who has the power of the resurrected Christ. Oh, the story gets beautiful. Angel of the Lord comes down, opens up the doors. All the prisoners are set free. No one leaves. And the guard comes running in. He sees all the prisoners. He thinks maybe they're going to escape. He's going to certainly lose his life to his authorities. He's ready to fall on his sword. And Paul says, don't you fall on your sword. We're all here. And the jailer turns around and he says, what must I do to be saved? Now, he's not asking a theological salvation question. He's wondering how is he going to explain this mess to the people who have the authority to let him live or to die. But Paul turns it around. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And he and his wife and his family are instructed and baptized. Boom! You've got a Philippian church using the power of the resurrection. I that power of the resurrection. Famous passage from Paul. I want to know the power of God so much and to be open to use that power so much that I can look in the face at all times, all situations. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to be abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've got to tell you, that is absolutely true. And if you haven't found it, my prayer for you is that you will find it. I know what it's like to abound. Literally, that means I know what it's like to be praised. Hey, pastor, good job. That lasts for about 15 seconds. I know what it's like to be put down, abased. That's when people have a whole lot of problems. They don't want to face them, so they criticize you. They make fun of you. They find something that they can tear apart in your life, and they'll do it. And that, too, is the power of the resurrection, because you learn to say with Jesus, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I know what it's like to be poor. In our first 12 years of ministry, Arlene and I were dirt poor. But she always had food to feed the hungry, she always had an empty room to house someone who had lost their home. She worked two gardens. She canned. We never starved. We were never without a roof over our head. And we had opportunity to minister that you just couldn't even believe. I know what it's like to be poor. I also know what it's like to have all my bills paid and have money in the bank. One recession could wipe that out. And you know what? I'm not really worried about that. Because my Christ is risen from the dead. And my Christ is alive. Let me share with you a famous passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's in chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness, your gentleness, your forbearance be known to everyone. The Lord's at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Oh, that's a wild passage, folks. 
People come up to me and ask me a standard greeting. They say, Pastor Frank, how are you? Or, or Frank, how are you? Or, hey, old man, how are you doing? And it demands an obligatory response. I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? What time is dinner? And did you make me any cookies? <laughs> now, if I respond, I'm rejoicing. Guess what they're going to ask? Wonderful. What are you rejoicing in? I'm rejoicing that I'm my fourth round of cancer treatment. Oh. I'm rejoicing that I have congestive heart failure. Oh. I'm rejoicing because I've got a pacemaker. I'm rejoicing because I have COPD. Uh-huh. I'm rejoicing because I'm bald. And I guarantee you, they're going to call an ambulance. <laughs> and they're going to bypass the emergency ward, and they're going to take me to a psychiatric unit. But you know it's true? Because in all this stuff that I've been able to go through, God has given me limitless opportunities for ministry that I would never have had if I didn't have all the things going wrong. And I gotta tell you, it's worth it. I get down and am able to speak with medical personnel who you would think would never speak to anybody about what's going on in their lives. I get to talk to fellow patients who are in pain and they're crying and we can sit there in the waiting room and we can join hands and we can have a prayer. I get to people every day who are hurting and we get to share Jesus Christ. And I love that. I love that we can share that Jesus Christ is alive, that his spirit is alive, and you have not got a single problem that God has not got an answer for. And folks, that's resurrection power. And it's mine, and it's yours. There's another famous passage in Paul's letter. He tells us to think Jesus. Now elsewhere in Romans, he says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. But listen to what he says in Philippians. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death on a cross. Let that mind be in you that allows you, by the power of the resurrection, to be a servant, to reach out in the name of God with the good news of Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior. One last passage I want to share with you. I have learned by the grace of God to put the past behind me. Sometimes that's, that's a good past. You can't keep reliving it over and over again. But it's also a past where there's been failure. You learn to walk away from it. This is what Paul writes. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, 
I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold on to what we have attained. You have the power of the resurrection right now. Okay, I'm out of breath. Wow, it's about time. So I want to end in this way. I think that you have been so, so blessed by your Pastor Mark. And I praise God for the day that he sent Pastor Mark to you. He is one of the finest expositors of scripture that I have ever met. And every time I am allowed to sit in the church and listen to his sermons, I am edified, I am uplifted, I'm fed, I'm ready to go. When I have the opportunity to go to Bible class, which is not always because of other conflicting schedules in ministry, I'm always fed. And I'm not talking about the cookies. <laughs> I pray because I know that Pastor Mark and his beautiful wife Lauren pray for you, that you will pray for them on a daily basis, that God would strengthen them with his Holy Spirit to continue to use the wonderful gifts and talents that he has given them to minister to you because I know that he is praying for you every day of his life. And yes, I think that he is very blessed to have you. In the name of Jesus, amen. The grace and the peace of God keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for resurrection power. Thank you that we can hold on to certainty. Thank you that we can get rid of complaint. Thank you that we can trust. Thank you that we can rejoice. Thank you that we can serve. Thou King of kings and that Lord of lords. Keep us walking, Lord, empowered by your spirit in the truthfulness and the grace of the resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen.